Hello, this is Tom from anti-proton.com and you can hear my Geiger counter ticking in the background as it usually does. And I wanted to talk to you today about alpha and beta radiation. Before I do that, I wanted to stop for one moment and explain quarks and neutrons. Remember the prerequisites for this class were in a basic understanding of what a proton is, a neutron, and an electron, if nothing more. You must at least understand those basic things. In so much as that every atom contains protons with orbiting, if you like, electrons, and most contain also neutrons. You must also have learned and known already that an electron is a negatively charged particle, a proton is a positively charged particle, and a neutron is a neutrally zero charged particle, electrically speaking. Now, but before I can explain beta and alpha, you must know why that is the case. Do you recall long ago when you were a child, you were told that rocks and water exist? You kind of knew that all right, already. And you knew they were made of things. You knew there was rock element, water element, and you believed that. After a while, you were taught that, well, the water is made of hydrogen and oxygen and combinations of these things, and the, the rocks were made of silicon and oxygen. These things were called chemical compounds and even molecules. You understood that, too. That made sense. You started learning that they were made of smaller things. You learned after a while, though, that, wait a minute, hydrogen and uh, oxygen and things are not just chemical compounds. They're atoms. So you would have a little nugget of hydrogen and another little nugget of hydrogen, and then you'd have an oxygen atom. These little atoms were separate and unique things, and when you combine them together, you had water. You understood that. That made sense to you. You accepted that. Well, then, I, I, I think that they asked you to go a little farther than that and understand that each one of these atoms, like that hydrogen atom, had a proton in it, and it had an electron. So you understood that these little circular things that you call atoms are actually composed of other things. They could contain any one of three different types of little building blocks, neutrons, protons, and electrons. So you you kind of grasp this concept that you learned that something exists and then you found out in reality it was actually made of something smaller. Then you found out that that smaller thing was made of something even smaller. And so far it's not really been that big of a leap and you've made that leap. Well, I want you to make one more leap. I want you to make the leap of understanding that a proton and a neutron are not really the same little single ball-like things you, you know them to be. A protons and neutrons are made of things called quarks. Quark. Well, let's use a capital Q. There. Quark. Quark. All right. Quarks come in six basic types. These are arbitrary names. They have nothing to do with any indication of how the quark behaves or performs in any sort of way. There's random names. You could have called them Bob, Steve, and Sally. But they come in the types, the two most common, up and down. It's just names. They don't mean anything. They're just names. Up and down. Top and bottom, strange and charmed. Six types. Technically, there's actually t there's actually 12 types because there's actually an antiparticle for each one of these. And remember, an antiparticle is kind of like the opposite of that particle, typically speaking, electrically speaking. Positive, negative, negative, positive, that sort of thing. You have an up and an anti-up, a down and an anti-down, that sort of thing. But don't worry about that. Just understand that there are these three things right here. Quarks don't usually exist by themselves. There are several different strange ways that they can exist, but one of the more common ways they exist are in groups of three. A neutron has a configuration of one up quark and two down. A proton has a configuration of two up and one down. And if you can see, they're kind of like the opposites of one another, aren't they? Sort of. Down has more mass than up, so neutrons are heavier than protons. Now let me explain to you an interesting little thing about quarks and protons and neutrons. This proton has an electrical charge of 1, neutron has a charge of 0, but wait a minute, how can this add up to 1? That adds up to 0. That doesn't make any sense, right? Well, it does. Downs, a down quark, let me move these out of the way, down quarks have an electrical charge of negative one-third. You're like, wait a minute, a negative electrical charge? Just trust me. It's crazy. It's insane. It's quantum-looking. 
and it's true. Up quarks have a positive electrical charge of two-thirds. So, let's take the neutron. The neutron is two downs, it's a negative third, plus a negative third, and an up, plus a positive two-thirds. What does that equal? That equals three, and negative one plus negative one plus positive two equals zero, doesn't it? And zero over three, anything over x, uh, sorry, zero over x is zero, right? Neutral charge. Let's see if this math holds up for the proton. Proton is positive two-thirds plus positive two-thirds. Those are the two ups. Those are two ups, remember? The ups have a two-third positive charge. What about that down? Plus a negative, sorry, write that directly, negative one-third. What does that equal? Well, let's do some really ridiculously simple math. Here's a three. Two plus two or four minus one is three. X over X equals one. And so you have it. That is how the quark configuration works. Because atoms are made up of protons and neutrons like they are, if these things could be flipped or changed, you could change the atom. And in fact, a, uh, an atom that contains one proton, one neutron, and one electron is a collection of seven total particles. One, two, three ups, one, two, three downs, and one electron. But you don't know them like that. You know them as a single object because it's easier to think of that way. In the same way it was easier when you knew of an atom as just being a simple little ball-shaped object. Now, let's move on to the next part of this, alpha particles. Alrighty folks, the next thing to talk about is alpha. Alpha particles, now that you understand a little bit about a nucleus, are actually pieces of a the nucleus. They're represented by this symbol here, which is the Greek A, or alpha, symbol. There is the word alpha. And this is what an alpha looks like. It is two neutrons and two protons. Alpha particles are energetic clumps of these protons and neutrons put together. Now, if you recall, I said a proton and a neutron are each actually made of three particles. So that's three times four. That's actually 12 particles that make up a single alpha particle. They're relatively large and dense things. But, of course, that kind of makes sense when you think about it. They're often represented by this symbol, helium, but with a little positive two. That's kind of not really true because the reality is they're not really a helium atom. They're like a helium atom, but they have no electrons. If you added two electrons to this, you would have a helium atom, just like you put it in a balloon. That's it. So you put it in a balloon, you breathe it down your throat, you make funny noises, and it's 100% safe. Well, I guess you could die from suffocation from the helium, but it's not radioactive. If you strip the electrons off and give it enough energy, it is radi radioactive. Almost all the helium you actually see around you comes from either, well, either from fusion sources or from alpha decay. In fact, alpha decay was a major contributor of helium from uh, things like uranium. Down here, if you're wondering what all of this is, let me cut the sounder on. I have a rock that produces alpha and gamma. We'll talk about gamma later. There's the rock. I'll show it to you in a moment. Alpha is being blocked by, well, somewhat by this piece of paper. There's a pretty good amount of gamma coming off of this rock, too. Once we remove the paper, we will get an even slightly higher dose than we did before from this rock. This rock contains, I believe, uranium and uranium-like elements and is most likely undergoing alpha and gamma decay. At least that's what I think. I can't tell because I don't have a mass spectrometer or an isotope analyzer. Regardless, an alpha particle is an interesting ex uh, uh, little, uh, an interesting experiment in quantum mechanics. Here, let me explain. Within a nucleus of an atom, let's draw two nucleons. We'll call this one a neutron and this one a proton. And then we'll put out this electron right here. 
all right? There are a couple forces. And put on another, we'll put on another proton, we'll put on another neutron. These two particles right here have a force pushing them together called the strong nuclear force. It doesn't want them to go away from one another. It wants them to stay close. But at the same time, they're both positively charged, right? Opposites, uh, repel, I mean, opposites attract equals and likes repel. So they have two, another force pushing against them, the electromagnetic force. These two forces don't quite cancel out, but they more or less cancel out, close enough. You get a, a well of sorts, a potential well. Think of it like this. If this is the position of a particle, and this is its energy required to be in a position, you get this curve. Lower energies, the particle can be right here. And there's many, many more of these particles. The particle could be found here very much more often. If you check the particle and chart each time you check its position, it's most likely going to be found here. There's a slight occasion where it can be found at one of these higher energies. As it gets higher up here, there's a slight chance that it could be it could actually get over this well. This dip, if you like, this depression. I'm kind of getting into the concept of the uh, part of the particle potential well, uh, the well uh, example in quantum mechanics, which we're not going to get into right this moment. But simplistically speaking, there is a slight chance, because of a uh, thing called quantum tunneling, that these uh, particles right here can be found in a position where they're just slightly outside of the bonds that would normally hold them. And when they do, they race off away from the atom at high velocities. Not very high velocities, mind you, but high enough. If this is a nucleus right here, this big thing, then this is the alpha particle flying away. They're, they're big and heavy compared to other radioactive particles, but they're still small compared to the nucleus. When an, when an atom undergoes decay this way and releases an alpha particle, it decreases what it is. It changes. It has to become smaller because, do you recall mass numbers and, and, and atomic numbers? If an element, we'll call it element X, has 100 protons and 110 neutrons, then it has 210 for a mass number because this, the number of protons, is represented by Z plus the number of neutrons, which you can take this and subtract this and get that. Remember all that stuff I told you about? Well, if it emits an alpha, uh, um, if it emits an alpha particle, this number here would have to decrease by 2. This number here would have to decrease by 4. And so now this is a different element. Maybe stable, maybe not. So this rock is slowly over an incredibly long period of time becoming something different. Something that it's currently not. God only knows what that'll be, but regardless. If I move a certain distance away from it, let's say over here, move the particle a distance away, it will decrease the amount of readings it gets because now I'm only picking up gamma. The alpha is gone. Now it still will read. If this were beta, it would still probably pick up at this distance pretty well and pretty strongly. But this is an alpha and a gamma. Now the reason the gamma is associated with the alpha is an interesting fact that I'll bring up in the next video when I talk about gamma. But understand that beta and, beta and, and, and alpha, which I'll talk about beta in a moment, are often linked to gamma. So anyhow, gamma partic uh, b alpha particles are generally 20 times more deadly to the body than gamma or beta. The reason being is their mass. They're like freight trains when they hit you. When they hit something, they don't go very far, but my god, did they tear everything up along the way. If you calculate that you have received 10 grays, the unit of measurement that one uses to, uh, to, to um, measure the amount of radiation that is absorbed into an object, and it's in um, alpha, then it's not going to be equal to 10 sieverts, which is the effect to a human being. Sieverts. It'll be much more than that. Because remember, sieverts are equal to grays multiplied by the severity of, of, of the radiation. It's called a weighting factor. 
it's usually, there's a multiplication symbol, it's usually denoted by W and a little r. Well, in our case, the weighting factor for alpha is 20. So 10 grays equals 200 sieverts of radiation. Now you say, wait a minute, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You just told me when this all started, Tom, that alpha particles don't go very far. They only have a short distance, and that is true. They have a short distance because they're so positively charged. They have no electrons, so they just get picked up by everything. Everything wants to grab a hold of them. And you also told me, Tom, that if you put a piece of paper like this cardboard in between, that's it. Done. These things can barely penetrate cardboard or paper. So if they can't penetrate cardboard or paper or even dead skin, which they can't, and everything picks them up and they have such a short distance, how can they possibly be deadly? Well, if you breathe them in, if I were to grind this into powder and then breathe it down my throat, that would be a very, very, very bad thing for me to do. Because <clears throat> alpha particles, once they get deep inside of your body and in your bloodstream, even though they don't go very far, they can penetrate cell walls pretty easily. And when they do, they're incredibly deadly because they just punish everything. They're very strong. Unlike gamma, which will mostly go through you. Almost 100% alpha won't. It'll stick right to you. Go right in. Alpha particles, by the way, do not get on you. Is it as popular as by TV? People do not actually be co become covered in alpha particles. They become covered in things that emit alpha particles. Tiny microscopic granules of this, which are emitting alpha. Alpha itself doesn't get stuck to things. If an alpha particle bumps into your clothes, a literal alpha particle, it would probably pick up an electron and just become a, a helium atom. So that's an alpha for you. Alpha particle is effectively a component of an atom. And this little tiny rock right here in all of its glory, is an alpha producer. And there it goes. Slowly increasing all the way up to the top. All right. So anyhow, let's move on now to beta particles. Alrighty folks, we've discussed alpha radiation and now on to beta radiation. In the same way a nucleus can become unstable and release an alpha particle, it can also release a beta particle, but how does that happen? Well first off, a beta particle is symbolized by the Greek symbol B, beta. If you're European, you probably call it beta. That's how they pronounce it, beta. Well, but I'm not a European, so it's beta. See? Beta. And a beta particle is an energetic electron and electron antineutrino, or the opposite of each of these, which would be a positron, which is an anti-electron, and a regular electron neutrino. Now you're saying to yourself, wait a minute, electron neutrinos and positrons, and what the, what the heck? Well, these are all of a weird family of particles called leptons. You don't really need to know about towels and mu's and all those other little funny leptons. But you do need to know, well, muons, but you do need to know about the electron. And most people know about the electron from um, seeing it on TV. First off, there's things like plasma globes, like this little guy right here. See, plasma globe, we can cut it on sometime if you like and watch the electricity zo zoom around. And also, of course, the very camera I'm using right now uses electrons. You can hear them right here. This is a Geiger counter, of course, as you all know, with my external sounder. And here is a packet of, uh, of uh, potassium. Potassium contains a radioactive isotope. Remember our discussion about atomic numbers and, 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 and mass numbers and such? Well, there's a specific isotope that exists inside of all potassium, which is radioactive. I bought this at the store. Regular potassium. See? It says so in the back. Potassium. And the potassium I bought at the store contains a small amount of radioactive potassium, which is being read by the Geiger counter. And if you're curious what this little thing is right here, I'll show you in just a second. In fact, I'll show you right now. Beta particles, being energetic electrons, have a negative charge. Each beta particle that comes out is negatively charged. Um, 
oops, give me my focus back in there. There we go, focus. Um, they, as a result of that, are picked up and, and attenuated very quickly. As they move through the air, they're attracted to positive, uh, positive uh, uh, polarities and will join up with atoms and, and do all kinds of things. Sometimes they can even convert into other types of particles. This is a piece of silver, an ingot of silver that's in between this potassium-40 uh, containing beta-emitting light salt, potassium salt, and this Geiger counter. Now watch what happens when I remove. Look at that, five counts per minute, seven counts per minute. Let's pull this out of the way. It's not a huge amount, but you notice there is an ever so slight difference between the two. And that difference isn't really showing very well right now, is it? And eh, it'll it'll show up over time. There we go. There we go. Potassium salt is more radioactive when you remove the lead, uh, the lead, the silver. The silver ingot right here was blocking it. The metal was attracting away the electrons as they flew through, and it was preventing it from working. Now. If you recall at the beginning of this video, I told you a little bit about quarks and quark configurations. And remember I told you about ups and I told you about downs and I told you about their masses. Well, I also mentioned about neutrons and protons. Well, here is a, a neutron. It has a configuration of two of, um, sorry, that's a proton. <laughs> Let me uh, draw that ag out again, but this time correctly. There we go. Down, down, up. This is a neutron. Notice the configuration. There are two down quarks and an up. And remember, up and down don't mean anything. They're just names. Some goofy scientist thought, oh, we'll call one an up and one a down. Well, this, the, this, this, this element and many other elements have maybe a few too many neutrons in them. And they're not very stable as a result of this. In order to become stable, one of the neutrons has to go. It's too difficult for the neutrons to exist from some, uh, to, to, go away from some atoms. If you recall, really large ones are able to actually release uh, some of their nucleus. Alpha decay. Remember alpha decay? But many times that can't be done. There's just not enough of them in the atom. Like potassium salt, for example, is really honestly too small to release alpha particles. It's just too small. The atom doesn't have enough in it. It has a mass number of, uh, of uh, well, the 30-something, uh, uh, I believe, off the top of my head. And uh, potassium, radioactive potassium, is mass number 40. So that's not really enough. Anyway, to change this, this down, if it became an up, would make this a proton, and then it would be stable. Well, that's fine, but here's the problem. When this converts into a proton, which it will, here, let's do that. This now wants to convert to a proton. And now, there you go, this down has become an up. Simple, right? But wait a minute, downs have much more mass than ups, so where does that extra mass go? And remember, E equals mp square, mass becomes energy. The two are related. That's what's happening in this right now. All right? And that, that atom, the, the nucleus, is spitting out all that extra energy, and that energy shoots out as something called a mitigating virtual particle. See? Mitigating virtual particle. Here it is. And that particle is a W particle. W boson particle, technically a W negative in this case. Anyway, this boson particle is flying on out at high velocities, and it disintegrates in a couple seconds, or rather it uh, uh, vaporizes, uh, it vaporizes, evaporates back into the uh, quantum mysterious world, if you like, and becomes an electron. This will turn in to an electron, negative, and it will also turn into an anti-electron neutrino. The two are always coming in pairs, usually. And there's, of course, a very interesting quantum mechanical reason for this, which probably is, exceeds the scope of this course. So anyhow, this, this down here became an up. And it, it, to do so, it had to release the excess energy. Now, let us make this more simple in, in the event that this is just too complicated. Because for some people, honestly, understanding this right here is a little complicated. So let's make it simple. Simple, 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 simple. Too many neutrons. Too many neutrons. Too many neutrons. 
Well, you turn a neutron into a proton, and that also releases an electron at high velocity, a beta particle. You can forget the neutrino if you like. It's not big enough to really matter in this case. That's how it pops out. So these things are, are this is becoming stable and releasing beta as a result. And there's the beta. Notice it's up in the 30 range now because I took out the piece that was in between it. Beta radiation can be very potent too. Let me show you. you can, if you get enough of something that's emitting it or something strong enough, and I, I'd like to point out that uh, light salt is not very strong. Light salt is very, very weak. It's perfectly safe. I have to place bags and bags and bags of it around my detector to really do much. But if I get enough of it, the detector can go a little nuts. If there's enough. Anyway, other things are capable of producing beta as well. For example, I've already tested it. This piece of granite countertop contains something in it that is producing beta, probably potassium or, or, or God only knows, there's so many beta producers, many, so many light beta producers. Some, there's probably some feldspar mineral in here that's probably producing the beta most likely. And uh, this little guy I know is a beta producer because from a very, very, very short distance, it'll produce a nice tick. But if I pr take something like a uh, cardboard and put it over top of it, and remember, paper will block alpha most of the time, almost no change occurs in the count. However, if I take the Geiger counter and move it more than a couple inches away, the count dissipates completely. Gamma would go that distance. Even though it would decrease, it would go that distance. Alpha wouldn't make it to the paper. What does that leave? Beta. Hey, we're not doing very well here. We're only doing 20-some counts per minute. Come on. Come on. We can do better than that for a good show for people. People demand a good show. Let's get this on top and get it going really good. We'll look at it in a minute and see what it got to. So that's what a beta particle is. Beta particles are usually stopped. In most books, they reference aluminum foil. Oh, a beta particle can be stopped by aluminum foil. That's true. Um, it can be stopped by um, sometimes by your skin and by other things too. When calculating sieverts of radiation, you take the amount the the amount of beta energy you get in grays here, and you multiply that by a weighting factor. Remember a weighting factor from my earlier videos? Well, the weighting factor this is the thing that determines how damaging it is. For beta, the weighting factor is a one. So 10 grays, that's a capital G, 10 grays of beta is exactly equal, because anything multiplied by 1 is 1, to 10 sieverts of, uh, uh, for the same material. There's no change. Grays equal sieverts in that case, simplistically speaking. So beta is pretty nasty, but it's not nasty like alpha, which if you recall was 20 times more deadly. 20 times on average. Beta usually isn't as deadly if it gets ingested. I'll keep in mind though, there's some nasty beta emitters out there. Uh, uh, our most recent Fukushima example, for, well, for example, produces cesium-137 and strontium-90. Both of these are beta emitters, as well as occasional gamma too. Oftentimes, by the way, and we'll get into gamma next video, oftentimes uh, uh, beta will emit gamma. Remember I told you how the nucleus is trying to release energy and it's trying to stabilize and whatnot? Sometimes there's too, too much energy for beta to be good enough by itself and you'll get a good gamma ray, but we'll talk about that later. These guys right here, both of these puppies, produce beta energy. Let's see where we are. 28. Well... I guess today we're not going to get a high. If I get this done just right, I've been able to get this up to 50 and 60 before, if done right. And it's perfectly safe. Beta in general is not necessarily safe, but the beta coming from this uh, potassium salt safe, it's not enough to do anything. Let's get rid of this and put out our stone. or granite countertop. Significantly less is put off by this granite countertop. It is by no means a heavy producer. 
but it produces a little. Not much. There, that should do. There we go. There's a possibility of some alpha being produced by that as well. Notice when I put it down, it had more of an effect. But that's your basics of beta particles right there. Beta particles are energetic electrons that shoot out, and very, very quickly as the beta particle moves along its path, it becomes attenuated by the various atoms that are nearby it until it's lost a lot of its energy. Now, I've heard people, and I should probably bring this up, I've heard people say, well, wait a minute. I thought electrons moved at full speed all the time, etc. That's not actually true. Beta particles have energy, and they can lose energy, just like everything else. When a beta particle loses energy, this is velocity. Remember, velocity is a vector. It has both direction and magnitude. So to change this, it is changing velocity. And it's usually changing it to the negative it will sometimes release a gamma ray. We will go into gamma tomorrow, but just understand that beta can actually lose gamma, it can actually lose energy as gamma. And so ironically, as these little beta particles shoot out of here, they could be producing secondary gamma, or even ultraviolet light and other random things, depending on the exact energies that are, that are involved. And you see, we're getting a slightly elevated reading, but not much. All right, well, that should do it for you folks with alpha and beta. You should now understand that alpha particles are a proton and neutron combination that's released from an atom based on some interesting quantum mechanic properties. Alpha is 20 times more deadly than uh, beta or gamma, or, or ga uh, gamma, normally, um, normally speaking. You should understand that alpha particles are highly positively charged with a positive electrical charge of two. You should also understand that only the heaviest atoms produce them. You should understand that beta are energetic electrons or positrons which are anti-electrons. You should understand that each one is accompanied by, electron by an electron neutrino of the opposite uh, uh, of the opposite charge so to speak a positive uh, positron will have a anti well sorry we'll have a um, I'm saying it backwards a, a negative electron will have an anti neutrino and a positive positron will have a regular neutrino so it's antimatter matter matter antimatter anyway last but not least you should have learned that quarks are what make up protons and neutrons and the quark configuration of a proton or a neutron is what determines uh, its charge and whether it is a proton or a neutron. They come in up, down, top, bottom, strange, and charmed. And there's also an associated anti-quark for each type, which we may go into at some other time and if I want to go more deeply into quarks. Anyhow, uh, if you have any questions, let me know. This has been Tom from anti-proton.com. Bye-bye.